Do you want to be made well? At first glance, this question seems like a silly question. Do you want to be made well? Seems like the obvious answer would be, of course, I want to be made well. Of course, I want wellness. This question, do you want to be made well, seems like a silly question, but since Jesus asked it, let's not pass it off too quickly as silly with an obvious answer. I hear you, well, who would not want to be well? Who would not want wellness and why? Why would someone not want to be well? And if by chance one discovers that their answer is no, what then can be done? That's what we will explore today. In this series on wellness, the spirit guided me to this very familiar passage of scripture for those who know biblical stories. And that is the story of the man who was an invalid laying by the pool the pool is named differently in different versions. I'm familiar with the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. There was a pool, the text says, in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate called in Hebrew Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, the, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. People who were not well, who wanted to be well, would wait for the stirring of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons in the pool and stirred up the water and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well from whatever disease the person had. This man has been laying by the pool for 38 years. That deserves a pause. Let that sink in for a moment. 38 years. And Jesus sees him, knows he's been there a long time, and asks the question among the most profound questions in the sacred text. Do you want to be made well? Why would Jesus ask such a question? I surmise that Jesus asked this question for three reasons. And the first reason is proximity. Because the man is this close to receiving a healing. The pool is right there. And in 38 years, he hasn't gotten from here to there. In 38 years, he has not made progress towards his healing, which is within reach. It begs the question, do you want to be healed? Next, Jesus likely asked this question because of longevity. This man has been stuck for a long time. And when someone has been stuck for a long time, it begs the question, does he or she or they, or they want to be healed? Lastly, I think Jesus asked this question because of curiosity. He's close, but he's stuck. And so he has not received his healing. Jesus asked because he's curious if the man does want to be healed, what has prevented him from receiving his healing? And that might just help us assess longstanding issues in our country and in our world, issues like poverty and homelessness and mass incarceration, to name a few. When there is proximity, the resources are right there and longevity, people are still stuck after a long time. We need to be curious about whether there is a what or a who that is preventing progress. So Jesus was curious and asked the man, do you want to be made well? And verse seven says that the sick man answered him, sir, 
I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I am making my way, someone else goes down ahead of me. Please know that there are people who are stuck in bad situations who need help. There are obstacles in the way, even if just from their perspective, which for the moment is the perspective that matters, obstacles that are keeping them from being the best they can be. Yet we'll say this person is making excuses. I've heard preachers say, and I may have even been the preacher who said it, that this person is making excuses. They like being in the condition they are in. They don't want to be made whole because being in their condition gives them something that serves them in some way, possibly attention, possibly sympathy. I am sure this is a psychological reality and maybe Jesus even understood this. Hence the question, do you want to be made well? In essence, do you want wellness? Because if you don't, I'll be on my way. But Jesus, thank God for Jesus, does not condemn the man for his response that sounds like an excuse to our ears. Jesus does not criticize the man. He does not browbeat the man. I love Jesus for Jesus heals the man. And may I suggest this idea of being a Christian is to be more and more like Jesus. Let's do less condemning and more healing, less criticizing and more healing, less browbeating people, looking down at people and more helping to lift people. Let's start with this. Let's do what Jesus did. Let's listen. Jesus asked the question, then he listened to the man and apparently took seriously what the man said, that people have been an obstacle to him. Jesus heard this and healed the man and told him, pick up your mat and walk. Wanting wellness is not enough sometimes to overcome the obstacles that are in the way in this country where healthcare costs are enormous. Wanting wellness is sometimes not enough. Resources cut and facilities closed that care for the mentally ill, such that Cook County Jail has become the largest facility housing the mentally ill in our state. Wanting wellness is sometimes not enough when there are obstacles in the way. So let me drop this in for some of us. It would be very Christian of us to be grateful if we have access to what we need to be well. And it would be very Christian of us to be mindful when someone else doesn't. Let me say that again. It would be very Christian of us to be grateful if you have access to what you need to be well and to be mindful when someone else does not. And if you're seeking a ministry, some work to do, maybe your work can be to help bring down the obstacles to wellness for those who would otherwise be well. I thank God for, we have people in this church, several people who are doing just that with more to come. So how do we recognize the obstacles that may just be in the way? The telltale signs are also in the text today. Once Jesus healed the man, verse 9 says that Jesus said to him, stand up, take up your mat, and walk. At once, the, maid, the man was made well, and he took up his mat, and he began to walk. Then the text says, now that day was a Sabbath. Uh-oh. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. Who told you to do that? Fast forward through the text, when the man ultimately told him Jesus, the Jewish authorities started persecuting Jesus for breaking the Sabbath law. Let's go back to longevity. 38 years is a long time. 
when something has been going on for a long time and it ends even abruptly, that's a big deal. When someone has been sick 38 years and they are healed, that's a huge deal. What an exciting event, a reason to celebrate. And it seems to me that from simply a human to human standpoint, one would be overjoyed for the person who was healed, right? Well, the next humans in the story, the gospel writer calls them Jews, but hear me, their ethnicity does not matter, only their humanity does. And after this miraculous event, these humans say it is the Sabbath. It is unlawful for you to carry your mat. And then these humans seek to persecute the one who healed the man and told him to carry the mat. There's something not well about that. That in the midst of a miracle, one would respond with meanness. That in the midst of hope, one responds with bitterness. That in the midst of witnessing major progress for a fellow human or humans, an opportunity for new life and new possibilities, I submit to you that anyone who responds with bitterness is not well. There's clearly something wrong here. Something has caused these persons who are unable to celebrate progress, but instead are fixated on the law to be bitter. Something has caused them to respond with coldness. Maybe the change was too much at once. Maybe being the religious law police has given them a sense of power and authority that they feel they must protect lest it slips away and they no longer have power nor purpose. Maybe experiencing those who have been down a long time just laying around the pool year after year for decades but never getting healed gave these other humans an inflated sense of self, of better than -ness. That as long as there is the other who is in a bad condition, that automatically makes me better. Maybe this human defined his self-worth both by his power as the religious police and his better than-ness. And the only way he felt good about himself is that those who are down stay down. There's something very wrong, even unwell within a person who in the midst of joyous, miraculous, hopeful event emphasizes the problem, looks for the blame and seeks to persecute the well-doer and can't let it go, think January 6th, insurrection and those who incited it. Mm -hmm. My question for him, that, that is the human in the text and anyone else who fits this description would be, do you want to be made well? Because at the moment you clearly are not well. Your heart is cold. And we see this every day in our country and maybe sometimes we don't see it because it's hidden in the infrastructure of oppressive systems and policies and practices. And that there are people who may respond to major signs of hope with bitterness, who respond to signs of progress with persecution who sit in seats of power and hold back progress for the least of these, all driven from a fear of a loss of power and prestige and purpose if those people, whoever they have othered, make progress. But Jesus, Jesus came with an ethic of love that can heal, set free, and deliver. A love that can transform, a love that can lift, a love that can make people well. This is the work of the church to bring healing, restoration, and hope. This story teaches us not to be discouraged by how long someone has been down or how long systems have been broken, but to be the church. That is to maintain and to actually embody the hope that things can change, lives can change, people.
people can be healed. Systems can be deconstructed and reconstructed and that the church can be a catalyst to turn lives around. Let us be wise and let us be aware that the story also shows us that there will be resistance to progress. That everyone does not celebrate when you celebrate. Some actually condemn and persecute those who would help turn things around. There are people with cold hearts and they are not well and may not want wellness if it means giving up power and if it threatens their inflated sense of self. So the question remains for the second man in the text, the persecutor and those who identify with him. Do you want to be made well? For this is the wellness Jesus wants for us. How do I know? Because Jesus continued to do good for people in ways that ruffled the feathers of those who were in power. From the very beginning of his ministry to the end of his ministry, he continued to demonstrate that love could raise people out of despair and that hate is not strong enough to keep love down. From the healing of the man born blind to the feeding of the 5,000 to telling the thief on the cross that today you will be with me in paradise, Jesus' whole ministry was to upset the status quo with a love ethic that taught that love can conquer all. Amen. And those who were threatened by love and hoped to kill him, that was not the end of the story. As a matter of fact, the end of the story has not yet been written because we who call ourselves followers of Christ still have work to do. Work of love and work of restoration and work of hope and liberation and healing. For if we love and that love moves us to action, there can be hope for the hopeless. And if we love and our love moves us to action, there can be help for the helpless. And if we love and our love moves us to action, we can be a voice for the voiceless. And if we love and our love moves us to action, we can overcome the damage that oppressive systems have done to whole groups of people. Yeah. I met a pastor and I'm in a program with a cohort of pastors and we were talking about the transforming love of God and the ability for the church to help transform. And he said, he's a pastor. He said, I don't believe we can transform anything. And I'm praying for him. It's a sign of, of burnout, a sign of discouragement, a, a sign of giving up is too much. We can't make an impact. I'm praying with him and we'll speak with him and pray with him and work with him. It's ultimately up to him and up to the spirit to work on his heart. As Dr. King and others have stated, and I, and I have to remind myself of this often because it does get long and weary. He said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends. Anybody have seen proof that it bends towards justice? It indeed bends towards justice. We need to keep our shoulders into it. But first, before we do any work, any more work, we've got to pause and do a wellness checkup. How is your heart? Do you harbor bitterness in the midst of joy? If by chance you identify in any way with the man, the person who condemned the man who was carrying his mat, if you find that your spirit has been jaded and you do not have a heart of compassion, if you find that meanness creeps in every once in a while and you totally ignore when new possibilities are right in front of you, but you dwell in traditions and rules and are bothered in the face of progress. If this describes the state of your heart today, the next question is, do you want to be made well? And my prayer is that we all want to be made well. And so we focus 
on wellness as a church, as we focus, I want to offer two prayers for our private meditation. The first is the prayer within the Psalm, in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, and it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. That's Psalm 139 integrated into your prayer life along with Psalm 51 verses 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. I encourage you to add these prayers to your prayer life. Add these prayers to your devotional life. Share these prayers with others who need it or pray for them. Create in them, oh God, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within them. Restore to them, oh God, the joy of their salvation and sustain in them a willing spirit. Then they will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. And with a clean heart and a willing spirit, we will love and our love will move us to action for I believe that Jesus, for Jesus, the ultimate sign of wellness is love. And Jesus wants us to be well. And I want to be made well. How about you? God bless you.